Hi guys, welcome to the Overdrive Digital Show. I am Sony Dutt. Uh, in a few moments from now, Bert and Rohit will be joining you to answer all of your queries. So keep them coming in our comments section. We'll start the show with uh, Citro. They are all set to enter the Indian market with the C3 uh, hatch crossover. It's a very exciting product because this will form the basis for Citro's affordable EV in India in the future as well. Let's take a look at what this car is all about. Okay then, no more teasing. This is the Citroen C3. This is not the Across. This is not a crossover. This is not their compact SUV rival of any kind. This is a hatchback. They insist that this is a hatchback. So the first thing that you will notice are these halogen headlamps. You get these LED DRLs on the sides. That's the detailing. Those are the halogen headlamps. You get fog lamps down below, and the orange housing that you see around the fog lamp that is customizable. In fact, all the orange bits that you see on this car are customizable to an extent. The roof can only be had in orange or in a black or in the body color. But we'll come to that in a bit. You see that aluminum finished scuff plate right at the bottom. The Citroen chevrons right on top, and they merge into those DRLs. You'll also see this mesh detailing in the grille. Like I said, Citroen is insisting that this is a hatchback, but the ground clearance is 180 millimeters. 180 millimeters, unladen, of course. There are about three people inside the car at the moment, and this car is rolling on 15-inch wheels, 195 section tires. You see this dual tone finish on the wheels, and on the lower spec trims. You will get a slightly similar-looking design, but those will be hubcaps, and you get disc brakes at the front, drum brakes at the rear, and if you look at the doors, those are the door handles, the pull-out door handles, and that is the door pad for the rear. So you get a bottle holder here. These are your door knobs. A little more storage space out here, and the power window switches for the rear are right here in the tunnel console. To give you a quick idea of the space, this is what it looks like. My opinions are on embargo, so how does this seat feel in terms of the comfort, etc.? I'm going to talk about it later in the review, so definitely do stay tuned for that. Let me now show you the rear end of the car. Let's get a closer look at the tail lights. No LED treatment here either. You get the conventional bulbs all around, and that's the C3 logo on the boot. The Citroen chevrons, and this is the full view of the rear. Again, like we saw in the front, you see the colored accents in the rear bumper. And you have the reflective elements in there. No rear fog lamp at the moment, and I use the word at the moment because if you see this unit here, I think that's a provision for a reversing camera. On the topic of reversing, you get two reversing sensors at the rear. No scuff plate, but you can have an accessory and can get an aluminium finished scuff plate at the rear, just the way we saw at the front. That's 315 liters of boot space. You get this parcel shelf. Look at the height of the loading lip, and that's quite a deep boot. 315 liters on the spec, and if you see the spare tire, it says the Seat Stepney. This is a space saver. It's a 185 section tire. With a 14-inch diameter. That is how the inside of the boot lid is finished. Cut braces right here. And now let me get into the front of the dashboard. So you get this orange panel here in 
inside as well it is done up in a matte it's all got, got this dimple defect as well and look at the size of the ac vents so there's one big ac vent here ac vents right here in the center and then you get this digital instrumentation a small digital instrumentation right here with the telltale signs and then you have the gauges on the side so this is the infotainment i'm going to quickly cycle through the infotainment radio phone android auto apple carplay these two are wirelessly possible this is the media bluetooth audio device list will essentially show you all the devices that you have paired with uh, this particular infotainment system and then there is wi-fi so you can have wi-fi capability on this and navigation to use navigation please connect your smartphone for projection so essentially like i told you wireless apple carplay or android auto and then the google maps from that smartphone interface will show up here so that is the infotainment for you this is a 10 inch unit and i don't know the number of speakers yet but I can see speakers here in the A pillar and you can see uh, the size of the A pillar right here and these are the outside rear view mirrors they are controlled mechanically using this stock right here so you can keep your phone here there's a USB A port here 12 volt charger here these are your AC controls on top this is the manual transmission you can see this is the 5 speed manual with a reverse so essentially the engine under the hood is the 1.2 PureTech 82 which means it puts out 82 PS of power. You can also have a 1.2 with 110 PS of power that's a turbocharged engine and here you will get a 6 speed manual instead. Those are the pedals, no dead pedal on the side but there seems to be plenty of room there. Is that enough is what I'm going to talk about in my review. no keyless go for this car let me also quickly show you the rear seat before that that's the handbrake more storage capacity here those are the power window switches for the rear and that is another storage compartment maybe for your phone there are two more usb ports for the rear seat occupants you can see it there and they are fast chargers fast charging ports is what I'm told now on the topic of the rear seats the rear seats are placed higher than the front seats so that everyone gets a good visibility is what Citroen insists uh, you get integrated headrests all around but you will see only two headrests at the back so this space I think should be good enough or safe enough only for two adults and a kid it's sitting on a 2.5 meter long wheelbase which Citroen claims is best in class better than most hatchbacks out there and that should liberate a lot of space on the inside, a lot of comfort on the inside as well. So you get these roof rails. You can have this roof in orange or black or in body color, or you can customize it the way you want later. You have decals and graphics and all kinds of accessories that you can put on this car to make it your own. So that is the Citroen C3. I told you the engine specs, I've shown you the features that it comes with and uh, we are driving this in Goa at the moment and we'll have the drive review up very soon so stay tuned to overdrive for it well Bert, Rohit uh, welcome to the show thank you hello, hello everyone Thanks for having us on the show. So quick correction uh, on that. Uh, there are four speakers. Now I know the number of speakers. There are four speakers. And those little units in the uh, in the A pillar are literally hollow. Uh, there are no speakers or tweeters there. Uh, so maybe on the uh, on the export model, they might have tweeters there. Uh, but yeah, the top end uh, car right now gets four speakers. Uh, that is what uh, we can confirm. But the rest of it is still on embargo. So you'll have to wait till uh, the 15th of this month. Yeah, let's let's not forget, guys. I mean, a lot of people out there watching. Uh, all of this is an embargo. A lot of this is an embargo, except for the fact sheets and data that we can be in a position to share, which is what Rohit has put out in that video. So, sit down before you jump the gun. Please don't shoot us. Uh, <laughs> all the factual information that's already out there in the public domain now. So, no opinions, no views, no reviews until possibly the next week. So, any? 
I think that's when yes, we have fifteenth of June. Fifteenth of June. It's five more days. Yeah. And yeah, people really have really just commented. Really two busy weeks coming forward now. On we've got plenty of action happening in the automotive industry. Massive amounts of movement. There's the new venue coming out very shortly. There's uh, of course uh, the Mahindra Scorpio coming out uh, very soon. We're going to be seeing the Toyota. Uh, Greta rival that's coming out very shortly. Then you got the new Brezza, the facelifted Brezza, uh, and then of course uh, this through the month of July there's a lot more that's happening as well, uh, including a lot of overseas travel for us. Both me and Rohit are going to be traveling quite uh, quite extensively in the coming months uh, to bring you some good stories from overseas as well. So you know there's there's going to be it's going to be a few busy weeks ahead. Full disclaimer and apologies right now if we are not able to make it for the weekend shows. Please excuse us, but we will be traveling somewhere or the other, uh, either within India or maybe overseas as well. Okay, Akshay is saying, and I know we are not supposed to talk about the car, but he's saying it's like a quid of Citro. Would you say that? Are you are you able to say that? Are you? Uh. Well, you can draw your conclusions. I think this you can draw your conclusions from looking at the imagery from the video bits that Rohit has shown to you, and uh, you know, draw parallels to the or other uh, get perceived notions as to what the size would be based on you know the size of people getting into the car and uh, you know the position outside the car for that matter. So you will have an idea of where and what size this the C3 is. Yeah, in fact, I can talk about the size of the car. Uh, I, I, those figures have already been published, uh, you know, long back when they showed the uh, vehicle for the first time. Uh, it's sitting on a 2.5 meter long wheelbase. Uh, you know, it is in that sub four meter space, but it's certainly larger than, uh, you know, cars like the Alto, the Quaid, etc. Uh, it's it's definitely a large car. I mean, a lot of people were also, uh, you know, comparing it to the likes of the Sonnet and uh, the Kyger and everything. Which is why I mentioned in my walk around that uh, Citroen is insisting that this is a hatchback. Uh, it is not not a crossover. It's not uh, one of these sub four meter SUVs or anything of that sort. It is a hatchback, and uh, I've shown you the equipment levels. Uh, you know, all of that is uh, in front of you. Uh, what I think about it, uh, what the positioning would be. What I think about it is an embargo, but what the positioning would be is something that even we are speculating at the moment, uh, because uh, in the Instagram post that we had, uh, I had mentioned that. I'm looking at a five to nine lakh rupee uh, price bracket, but after that, they told us that there are going to be only two uh, variants available uh, for this vehicle, uh, two engine variants, of course, and uh, two trim levels. Uh, so I'm not sure if the price bracket would be that uh, wide. You know, it, it may not even be five to nine. It could be a much uh, smaller price bracket uh, than that. Uh, it could be a maybe a you know five to seven or maybe a six to eight kind of a price bracket. Uh, so you know you can draw your conclusions. It's certainly not a quid rival. Uh, let me tell you that it is. It is a larger car than that. And uh, in Citroen's own words, it's not a Sonnet rival either. Uh, so you know there will be a crossover, a C3 Air Cross, which will come next year. There'll also be a C3 electric uh, vehicle, electric hatchback, based on this very car. So in all, by end of next year, uh, there'll be three vehicles on this platform: the C3 that you just saw, a C3 EV, and a C3 Air Cross, which would be a Crossover that will take on the Kyger. Okay, Mayusha says that uh, he thinks that ventilated uh, seats should be made mandatory in cars which cost above six lakh rupees. What do you guys think? I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. I think there should be there should be a session of the oh, yeah. parliament that should be held in cars instead of uh, the actual parliament, and uh, it should be in the summer months. They should all be made to sit in cars and do the the session, and I'm sure they'll all want uh, automated climate control. Ventilated seats, uh, maybe even pre-cooling wire, your key or uh, connected tech. All of this to be made uh, a standard feature. So I hope that happens. I completely agree with you on that. Alright, do we know what the end cap uh, rating is for the C3? No, not right now. No, not right now. And not uh, right the end cap rating for this car will have to be different from what end cap ratings will be probably as in for Europe or for that matter, because this is a made in India car. Uh, the material quality will certainly not be the same as that uh, what is being sold in Europe. So a lot of things will change, and this car will need to be tested all over again. Okay, uh, Rohit Akshay wants to know BMW. Why has BMW taken so much time to uh, launch the restickered RR310? That's so unlike BMW. 
Uh, well, I think I'm going to hold my horses here till I actually see the product. Uh, it's supposed to be shown to us in July. Of course, the unveil is uh, is likely to happen before that. They've been running contests on their social media to do this. Uh, so I'm going to sort of hold my opinion uh, about this, uh, you know, until I see the motorcycle. Of course, the teasers reveal that it could be, like you said, just a re-stickered RR310. But, uh, you know, some sources also suggest, not very reliable sources though, but they also suggest that it could run more equipment uh, than what uh, TBS is offering with the Apache. So uh, let's let's just give it a little bit more time uh, till we actually see the product, what it is all about. Uh, if it's just a, uh, you know, a re-stickered vehicle like what Toyota and uh, Maruti are doing right now, is it something like that? Or is, going to, is BMW going to go further and uh, do something more over and above uh, the RR310 than just sticker jobs? Uh, that is something that remains to be seen. So let's first see that and then, uh, you know, uh, let's uh, discuss this in uh, in detail. But it may be a good idea. It may be a terrible idea. Why and how, I will talk about when I see the motorcycle. But why is there an uh, embargo on the Citro C3? Any particular reason? Well, it's not just the Citroen C3, but the every manufacturer applies an embargo. And I think it's a fair thing to do because it gives ample and equal opportunity to everybody to put out their points of view across at the same time or you know we've seen in the past uh well there used to be a tendency i my exclusive my exclusive and let's let's be very clear exclusives don't come uh free of cost there definitely is uh well an unsaid uh arrangement for those exclusives and expectations as well that have to be met but uh embargoes are applied so that everybody gets ample amount of time an equal amount of time and it maximizes the reach for a particular manufacturer rather than you know alienating any one particular story and spreading that over a period of time which doesn't really do much justice uh, for new products that are coming on the market and i also think that uh, you know if you do not have an embargo that uh, that race to be first out there with the story and get that review out there uh, you know it uh, it just creates uh, bad quality content many a times fact checking doesn't happen people don't wait to even uh, you know drive the car uh, i have literally seen some industry colleagues take a photograph of a vehicle that is being driven by the driver of the company, not even getting into the vehicle and still publishing, uh, you know, uh, two, three page long stories and reviews about the product. Uh, so I think embargoes are a good idea. At least it lets you, uh, you know, spend enough time with the vehicle, gather your thoughts and then put out the review instead of just rushing into it. So I'm, I'm all for embargoes. Okay, uh, Rohit Akshay wants to know what about ventilated seats for two wheelers? Uh, air conditioned helmets, ventilated seats for two wheelers. I think it's all a useless idea. I mean, it, I don't think it works. I honestly don't think it works because you are exposed to the elements. There is, you know, in a, in a, ca in a car's cabin, you're at least sort of uh, hopefully covered from the sun because of the roof and of course the angle of the sun also depends but you're hopefully covered uh, from the elements from the wind from the dust all of that and then the ventilated seats add a layer of comfort uh, to the whole thing on a motorcycle you are exposed to the elements all the time you are battling those elements all the time so you know i don't know if when if uh, ventilated seats on a motorcycle are really going to make much of a difference to my life i mean what is the point if the rest of the body is burning because of the sun your thighs are getting cooked because of the engine your calves are getting cooked because of the engine it's only your butt that is getting some you know kind of cooling from the seat i mean no point what you on mute Akshay's question was supposed to, was intended to be a pun. But Akshay, Fine, I mean, we still have you, uh, you we like talking about it. Then stand on the foot pegs and let the air do the rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, here's one from uh, Harsh Raj. He says, should he wait for the G310 RR or should he go with the G310R? Does RR have something to wait for? More performance? Uh, that's exactly what I said, Harsh. So I don't know if this is going to be just a sticker job or are they really going to do something, uh, you know, over and above what the Apache is offering you. Of course, the scope is going to be limited on how much BMW will be able to offer over and above the RR310, if at all. Uh, because, uh, you know, TVS is certainly pushing the envelope uh, with the RR310. Uh, how much you now BMW will do uh, to that end, I don't know. So let's maybe wait till... Uh, uh, till July, till the vehicle specs come out, till everything comes out to see if uh, it's a significant improvement over the RR310. Uh, but honestly, if I was out in the market right now, uh, and if this is the kind of question that I had, uh, it would 
essentially boiled down to the body style. If I wanted a naked, I would go with a G310 R. If I wanted a super sport, I would certainly go uh, with the TVS because also remember, if this is a BMW, even if it's just a sticker job, if this is going to be bought at BMW dealerships and serviced at BMW dealerships, they're not going to be as cheap as a TVS dealership. The service costs are not going to be in the same uh, you know, bracket. You can easily do a comparison. If you know someone who uh, owns a G310R or a G310GS, you can compare the service cost between that and what TVS would be charging for the RR310. So uh, that will give you a, a quick idea. You, if you are buying a premium product uh, from BMW, they will obviously uh, charge you a premium even for the service. So it will be down to body styles and maybe the RR310 will still be the better buy. But again, I'm going to hold back all those opinions till I actually see the motorcycle, ride the motorcycle and, you know, add, uh, basically answer all these allied queries with it. Redbird, here's a question for you. Have you taken up Zach Hollis on his no honk challenge? I don't honk anyway, so I don't know what the challenge was all about. I mean, that's that's for all the guys who honk, obviously. So, I guess Zach needs to work on his no honking a little more than just one day in the year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't honk in any case. So, I don't know what was the challenge all about. Isn't every Wednesday a, a no honk day in Mumbai? Isn't Why is only a Wednesday uh, a no-honk day? Why can you stop you know, honking? What's something better day? than... <laughs> so it's like Wednesday is one day, I will not honk and the rest of the week I'll go absolutely batshit crazy. See, about at so, Ine, this is something that you can relate to, of course. I don't see the reason of having a, a women's day. Why do, why do you need one day uh, to respect I the never, women? Right? I never it, said this. It no, has no, to no. be... It has to be <laughs> I don't think you would go that route, but... Uh, I don't no, I mean, it's, this, it's the same thing. I mean, there's a way you would want to respect a woman every day and not need a specific day for it. You're Similarly, okay. just don't honk. Why do you need a specific the garage door for controversy? So let's not go there. But yeah, no, no honking yeah. or all of these things. I mean, these these are these are these are things that you would you should be doing normally. And you know, but you know, exactly. you know, what really having said it's, that, it's I think it's a good uh, initiative, but it's honestly difficult to implement. Even I am against honking. But there are people in our city with in narrow lanes, people walk right in front of you, they don't, you know, they are not mindful of traffic coming. So then it becomes very difficult to drive without honking because there'll be someone right behind you who will be honking, not knowing what's going on ahead, you know, going on ahead if someone's walking right in front like, of the car. Or it is a country, it, it is it is a it is a challenge for us in terms of you know regulation, not just regulation, but natural habit. It's a habit for us. To yeah. use roads for whatever we want to do on them, any way we want to do, you know, wherever and whenever and whatever we want to do on them. So, unfortunately, uh, it's something we got to live with. And honking is an essential part of everyone's journey every single day. I don't dispute that. A lot of people try. But it also means that you just have to exercise a little bit more patience than everyone else around you to avoid honking. Uh, people will clear the roads out. You will find a way around them. Just ignore the dummies on the road and just move on, move on with your business. I, the one case about honking, of course, is at traffic lights, essentially. I mean, there's a guy who's five lanes down, six lanes down, probably, or six rows down, and they'd start honking the minute they see traffic lights going green. I mean, everybody sees at the same time. You aren't any faster or not everybody's as quick or nobody's waiting. You know, it's not the green for the for the race, for the race start. Then everyone's going to fire off on all cylinders and pause away from the traffic lights. It doesn't work that way. So you just have to exercise some patience. Unfortunately, this country has no patience whatsoever. I'm not sure where we are in a rush to go to, but uh, everybody seems to be in a rush to get somewhere. Okay. We have a question, uh, Rohit, from uh, from Sujashish. Can we expect a TVS GS310 version 2? Uh, well, that's, that's a very interesting question. And that's something that I want to ask TVS. Because uh, from what I remember of the 310 uh, you know, platform, uh, there was a clear no compete agreement between the two uh, companies that uh, you know certain body styles will be manufactured by TVS, uh, the others uh, by BMW, and uh, that was the whole agreement. And now with uh, this full fed motorcycle, a uh, super sport motorcycle coming out from BMW, uh, I want to. I'm really uh, intrigued to find out from both these brands what happens to that agreement if uh, TVS is allowed access uh, to the super sport body style. The sorry if. Uh, BMW is allowed access to a uh, super sport body style. Does TVS get access to an adventure uh, as well? So that is something that uh, I really am intrigued to find out now. Because as far as I know, I think the agreement even went down to the level of TVS not having their own adventure motorcycle, their own developed adventure motorcycle in that space. Not 
not even using that engine from BMW, but not even using their own engine. So now I really want to see if uh, you know TVS can build an adventure because that would be uh, one exciting uh, proposition if they are able to bring that same cost ratio to uh, that space. It would essentially mean another nice product for us to buy. And I must point this out because someone else, Shopmeister, has done this Rohit. And it's exactly what I told you. Please take that helmet off the ledge at the back of your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to fall. Don't no, worry. It's been love that. Please, please get that off. <laughs> it's a, it's an incident in the making. <laughs> Suja Shish is also saying, are you forced out of home in the balcony? <laughs> uh, uh, sort of yes. Sort of yes. There's some civil war happening inside. Change so, so of scenery. Have to be, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, Kunal wants to know: Will uh, six airbag regulation cause uh, some of the lower models in the car of cars to be discontinued? Well, the six airbag regulations is going to be a bit of an issue, especially for most manufacturers, because this increases the cost. But no, they will still implement it, and the cost will be passed on to the consumer, whether the consumer wants it or not. It doesn't mean that the lower model cars will be discontinued. They just have to offer those airbags, and there's no other two, two ways around it. Um, and unfortunately, this was kind of put into place, or this was lobbied for by the one manufacturer who probably has the most to lose with this regulation coming into place. But uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a sticky situation. It's going to increase prices of cars considerably. Okay, uh, and that is of course something that we'll have to live with. It is a good uh, it is a good initiative, but I think what the government is doing is 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 at some level, uh, uh, you know, how would I say it, um, reactive and not proactive. Uh, we need to get harsher regulations, driving laws, licensing in place. People need to be more aware of what they're doing. Uh, safety is not just about adding all of these safety devices into your vehicles, but also mentality. Uh, and unfortunately, Indians don't have the mentality of safety there. So we, are, we are one of the most unsafe nations in the world. All right. Um, but here's another question. Mangesh wants to know, do you think the Virtus has been priced well? Is the Virtus rightly priced? Well, I would say it is priced smartly. Yes. If you look at, uh, if you head to order social media, I mean, especially on Instagram, uh, IOD Mag, then what you notice there are the spec comparisons between it and the price comparisons, comparisons between the Virtus and uh, the Slavia and the Virtus and the City Hybrid especially. And what you observe over there is that the start at the starting at the bottom end of the pyramid, uh, the prices for the Virtus are steeper than let's say the Slavia and uh, the city. But as you go higher, it becomes fairly competitive, falling down a little below uh, the Slavia's top end version. Uh, but in in Skoda's defense, Skoda has got two variants of the 1.5 liter. Uh, petrol engine with a DCT box and uh, and the and thing. So you've got two variants over there, the manual transmission. You've got two variants there, but but Volkswagen has only opted for one variant, which is the automatic transmission, the 1.5 liter. They're not coming out with the manual transmission as of now. They may do so in the future if there is a reasonable demand for it. But from what they're seeing right now, the demand at the higher end is largely for automatic. So they want to stay that way and they want to maintain that position. Where the hybrid is concerned, the hybrid is about a lakh, lakh and a half more expensive, about 19 and a half, somewhere thereabouts, compared to the uh, compared to the Virtus. Uh, but what you're getting with the city hybrid, also keep in mind, is tremendously better fuel efficiency. The Virtus at best gives us about 18 and a half kilometers per liter on our tests when we ran the car in Bangalore, some of the worst conditions, we got 22 kilometers per liter. So you can imagine that, that that four kilometers is a tremendously better fuel efficiency rating where the city hybrid is concerned. But for the rest of the cities, uh, well, I wouldn't really put much uh, thing over there. For the city hybrid, of course, phenomenal car. Uh, we will come out to the comparison very soon and detail all of these uh, bits between the Virtus, the Slavia, and the city hybrid. So just keep an eye out for that. Okay. Um... Just looking for other questions as well. Uh, there was one interesting question that I wanted to take, Soini, and this was from um, Mayur Shah and Sangha PB07. Yeah, about the XUV. What kind of mods can I do on my Polo? I'm a bit skeptical as of now. Should I go on with mods? This is what Mayur Shah says. Whereas Sangha says Polo 2013 uh, and Swift 2022. Which one has good handling and braking? 
Well, Sangha, I'll answer your question first. The Polo has got better handling and braking. Uh, the Swift is a lighter car and of course far more nimbler in that sense. You can throw it around quite confidently. But overall, the Polo has got the better handling uh, and braking. Uh, Mayur, uh, what kind of mods you can do on a Polo? Well, uh, you could start small, start simple. Get a stage one uh, ECU remap done. And of course, you could also go in for the free throw exhaust. Uh, job done uh, and these are tuned exhausts so well, when you're driving in traffic and at low RPMs you really can't make out the exhaust load from that. Free tool also gives you a slight bump in power, which gives you better thermodynamics and better responses for that matter. Uh, at higher speeds you will hear a spotty load. But these are two uh, changes I think I could recommend to you uh, initially and then you can go on to doing whatever else you want. Uh, as of now that's the car is grippy enough, the car is fairly dynamic in that sense well well engineered steering fantastically engineered uh, handling elements so more than that i don't think there's anything else that you would require okay sangha wants to know um, that uh, the adas in the xuv 7w is it safe yes it is safe uh, adas by nature uh, sangha is is about all about safety and these systems definitely work around the cars it's just that in Indian conditions, things could get a little confusing at times. We have not, to be honest, really tried this out to see how well it works in Mumbai or Delhi traffic conditions for that matter, where Indians are absolutely haphazard with their driving. We'll cut in before you, we'll honk, we'll try and squeeze their way through. <coughs> I'm not sure how it actually work in those conditions, but from what we've tried so far, uh, everything works seamlessly. Uh, Mayur also says that uh, he's done an online inquiry on both the Vortis and Slavia and they're pushing the smaller engine than the larger one. Why is it so? I'm not sure what you uh, mean Bigger that profit margins. Yes. I'll, I'll just answer that. Bigger profit margins. So uh, this is something that we uh, also sort of confirmed with the dealers. Uh, so the 1.5 is an imported engine. Remember that. The 1 liter is locally assembled. Uh, the 1.5 is uh, it, it comes in as a fully built engine uh, it's imported in that sense uh, so obviously the price is higher they are paying higher taxes on that uh, even warranty claims are obviously going to be a little bit more sophisticated a little bit more challenging uh, you know uh, compared to the one liter so which is the reason why uh, they are pushing the one liter a lot more because the margins are much higher uh, which is why i think in certain dealerships uh, you have to book a test drive for a 1.5 they may not even have that uh, you know in the in the showroom and they might have to call for it uh, that is what i was told uh, i'm not sure if the situation has changed right now but uh, initially that is uh, what i was told that in some of the cities they would not even have the 1.5 variants on on a test drive so higher margins that's the short answer to it but how affordable will the ckd version of the volvo xc40 recharge uh, how how uh affordable is it likely to become um i don't know if you will have much of a difference to be honest because in the next few months the price will anyways increase and by the time the ckd comes down to india you know you would more or less be at the cost structure where the uh, current the import the cbu recharge is at uh, very close to that uh, there definitely will be some savings for that uh, matter but how affordable i really can't tell you this point in time just instantly i mean what i can tell you is that the cbu to the ckd that's about 125 150 percent duty that will go off it uh, so in that sense, it will become significantly more uh, affordable. But at the same time, Volvo will bump up a lot of things over here and there to keep that price bracket or rather for it to exist in that similar price bracket. Because that also means slightly better margins for them. Rohit, do you think uh, that Indian customers go for cars with more features uh, compared to the <coughs> build quality? Of course they do. Of course they do. That is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, deciding factors uh, in a car. The number of features, uh, you know, sometimes people don't even care about how many features are usable. Uh, if you are a regular to the O-Drive show, uh, you would also remember that a couple of years ago, we did this uh, story about the connected tech. Uh, you know, right now it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be the hot topic and every car maker is throwing new numbers with every launch, right? Uh, 30 connected features, 35 connected features, 60 connected features, 100 connected features. And that's exactly why we did that uh, myth busting story. How many of these features are really useful for you? How much are you really going to use? Uh, you know, so uh, it's the same case with the rest of the features as well. So sometimes, uh, you know, they don't even make any difference to your life. You're never going to be using them. But just because the feature list is quite fat, uh, people just think it's a better car or it's a more value for money offering. So uh, yes, features are a very big factor. 
uh, in choosing uh, a vehicle. In fact, I remember speaking to the Nissan uh, designer as well a few years back. This is when the Magnite was being conceived. Uh, and if you look at the Magnite, they've literally thrown the kitchen sink at it with uh, whatever features they could cram in. Wireless Apple CarPlay, the wireless charging pad, you know, all those kind of things. And uh, those those are uh, features that you've never seen of, uh, you know, in, in these kind of, or never even heard of in these kind of segments. So, yes, features are very important. Okay. Um, I think, I think more than news story. Yeah. We have uh, quite a bit, in fact, especially in the two-wheeler section as well. So we'll uh, quickly run through the news. Just give me one second. Okay, so we'll start, of course, uh, with the Vertis launch. Uh, the one-liter manual TSI uh, starts at 11.21 lakh rupees, going up to 15.71 lakh rupees for the top-of-the-line automatic variant, while the 1.5-liter TSI Evo variant, which is the performance line uh, that sits at the top, with a price tag of 17.91 lakh rupees. The service package of the Virtus 1 liter variants start at 20,338 rupees for four years, while it's uh, 22,881 rupees for four years for the 1.5 liter variants. Uh, fifth year onwards, the service package will cost the owner 11,525 rupees. You can uh, revisit our Virtus review on our YouTube channel just in case you need a refresher. But also caught up. Uh, with the brand director of Volkswagen India. And here's a quick uh, bit from that interview. Congratulations thank on the so launch of the much. Virtus and some very competitive pricing that we've seen for the sedan. Yes, thank you so much. I think uh, we owed it to the customers, we owed it to the market. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, you find the, pr the pricing competitive. Well, what do, you, what do you think is the sedan market shaping up to be like? You know, it's an interesting uh, question. If you look at the sedan body style itself, it has stayed constant at around 11 to 12% of the market. The premium mid-size sedan segment actually was at around 95,000 uh, cars last year. And with the introduction of the Virtus and uh, a similar car from our sister brand, I think the segment is going to grow to around 140,000 to 150,000 this year. All right. Uh, up next, big news coming in from Volvo India. The, v for, uh, the XC40 recharge uh, will be locally assembled in their factory, in Volvo's factory near Bengaluru. This makes Volvo their first uh, premium brand uh, among luxury car makers to begin an EV local assembly in India. The company also plans to go fully electric in India by 2030. <coughs> and this seems to be a strong step in delivering uh, that promise. And uh, the next piece of news comes in from Tata Motors. Uh, they have now bagged the largest ever EV fleet order in India to supply 10,000 units of uh, the Express T EV electric sedan to the EV ride hailing service provider Blue Smart Electric Mobility. This is in addition to the previous order of 3,500 EVs that Tata Motors received from the startup last year. Blue Smart functions in the Delhi NCR region but also plans to expand operations to other cities in India soon. Now, coming to the two wheeler section, uh, Rohit. So uh, let's let's start off uh, with uh, the smaller news. We'll get on to the Bajaj uh, news a little bit later. Uh, let's go in reverse order today because the Bajaj news is quite big. And uh, before we head out to that, uh, we'll first finish the Kawasaki news. So the 2022 Kawasaki uh, ZX4, uh, the Ninja 400, uh, has been launched in the global market. Uh, I hope that it will come to India very soon, but. Uh, I hope it doesn't come at an exorbitant price tag uh, the way it was priced earlier. I hope they are able to do a price correction. Uh, but the biggest change, of course, is that the engine is Euro 5 compliant. It puts out 44 PS of power, 37 Newton meters of torque. Uh, so it's down by one Newton meter for all you number nerds there. Uh, but essentially, it's a greener uh, motorcycle. No pun intended. Uh, and like I said, I just hope it comes in at a better price tag than before. They're able to uh, you know, get a better pricing than before. And it Where's the uh, the Twin River logo? Of course, the new Kawasaki logo or the historic logo, let's put it that way. And uh, new styling as well in terms of the graphics uh, that is inspired by the ZX10R to an extent. Uh, the other bit is the G310RR that we have been discussing uh, today on this show. Uh, so the pre-bookings for that have opened already. Uh, so if you are interested in the motorcycle, you don't want to wait till uh, its actual launch. 
and these teasers have excited you, then uh, you could head to uh, the closest BMW dealership for you and you could book yourself the G310 uh, RR already. The launch is uh, supposed to happen on the 10th of July, if I'm not wrong. And uh, the deliveries will uh, begin soon after on a first come, first serve basis. And now is the big news, of course, uh, for uh, from Bajaj. Uh, this is about the Chetak. No, they haven't launched the long range Chetak yet. Uh, but what they have done today is uh, to commemorate the 84th birth anniversary of Rahul Bajaj. They have moved the production of the Chetak from a very small facility uh, that they had in Chakan, where they produce their motorcycles, uh, to a much bigger facility now uh, in Akurdi. And that was a facility where Bajaj would build the older Chetaks, the, the first generation Chetak back in the 80s. And that is where they have moved back now. And the Chetak now becomes a full EV portfolio. Uh, but we have a lot of details on that, so do catch up the story. Do not, uh, you know, tune out. Uh, this is a this is a longest story, but you want to wait right till the end. Uh, and uh, there are there is some big scoop that uh, you know Rajiv Bajaj has given exclusively uh, to us at Overdrive and CNBC. So you want to hear each and every bit very carefully. It's a very big scoop. So I'm not going to reveal any more, anything further. Take a look at the story. Today is the 10th of June and it's a very special day for the entire Bajaj family because this date is the birth anniversary of Rahul Bajaj. So to commemorate that, to celebrate that, his son, Mr. Rajiv Bajaj, has pulled off a very special move. What you see behind me is the original assembly line of the Chetak. It was established in 1983. It began operations precisely on the September of 1983. And now, today, they have turned this into the assembly line for the Chetak EV. This is keeping in mind that Chetak was touted as Rahul Bajaj's favorite son by his loyal employees. With this move, his son Rajiv Bajaj hopes that his father would be happy to see the progression of the Chetak brand into an EV portfolio. And the Chetak EV is not going to be just one electric vehicle, it is going to be an entire portfolio going forward. We already knew this when they launched the EV or the Chetak EV a few years back, but now they've also established a new company called Chetak Technology Limited or CTL. Now this facility that you see here today has a production capacity of 800 units a day. That's about 2.5 lakh units every year. This 11 acre facility with in-house R&D, engineering, paint shop and production will only make electric vehicles. The other big deal for this production line is all the different shops are under one roof. So essentially R&D, engineering, uh, component sourcing, everything is going to be under one roof, so to say. In fact, from the suppliers to this assembly line, it's only going to take about an hour. That's the kind of reduced time that they're looking at to ramp up production to ensure that the supply chain, the production is always on target. By unifying the processes and making all the development in-house, Bajaj will have a much tighter control on the functionality and reliability of its products. So if I may say so, we are not a company that picks up a random design from Europe, some not so good parts from China, assembles it somewhere in India and sells it all over the place. The most important aspect of work is the acquisition of knowledge. This is the highest, most important purpose of work. It is not just to make something, sell something, make money, export. Of course, this is very, very important for a business. But the highest purpose of work must be knowledge. Just as 30 years ago, Bajaj Auto was the place where you could come and participate in making some of the world's best motorcycles, which we have done successfully. In the same way, the message we are sending out today is that this facility, this focused, integrated, agile facility from R&D to production to, to assembly represents for a, perhaps the finest place for someone to work in whichever function if they wish to participate in making some of the best electric vehicles in the world. Chetak Technology Limited will have more than 11,000 employment opportunities in the supply chain within the next three years. And another very important factor is they are also opening up a lot of job opportunities for women. We already see a lot of women working here on this production line and that's a very big plus. The new plan then will not only reduce the waiting period for the Chetak EV, 
but will also spearhead the development of future EVs from the brand, with the next big offering coming in 2023. Okay, there's one more video that we'll play now. We also had a chance to catch up with Rajiv Bajaj himself and here's what he had to say on some of the more relevant topics. The Chetak itself is concerned. Yes, work started on the Chetak more than three years ago, I think about six, seven years back. Um, we launched it in uh, 2019, I believe, towards the end of 2019 from a temporary facility at our Chakhan uh, plant uh, where we make motorcycles. Um, but it was always on our mind that we must have uh, a Chetak specific facility mm -hmm. um, and by Chetak I mean not just one scooter, it will be a brand uh, which will over time mm -hmm. uh, offer a whole portfolio of products for different segments uh, that will be rolled out over the next few years. Uh, we will continue to invest also and make effort also towards uh, uh, ICE uh, products and technology. But I can tell you this, that uh, in terms of new developments, uh, specifically new uh, engine and uh, part train developments, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we have just one uh, all new uh, ICE uh, uh, part train under development. Uh, of course, the existing um, ones we continue to upgrade, uh, whether for regulatory reasons, quality reasons, cost reduction, value engineering, etc. But we have only one new ICE part train under development. Everything else that we have under development, whether it is for Chetak, whether it is for motorcycles, our own brand or KTM Husqvarna or three-wheelers uh, is all electric. Well, there will definitely be new Chetaks next year. Uh, whether one or more, I don't know right now. To be very candid, I would put the blame primarily on the environment that has led to uh, uh, these incidents. You know, I don't think uh, uh, companies go out there consciously to make a defective product. You know, and frankly, my belief is there are only two kinds of electric vehicles out there those that have caught fire and those that perhaps will catch fire, you know. So, you know, tomorrow a cheetah could catch fire. We have to uh, accept that we are so, f uh, so much at the beginning of the learning curve mm -hmm. that we really don't know what we don't know, mm -hmm. you know. But what is important is the attitude of the company mm -hmm. to a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, you call them startups, uh, I call them upstarts. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these uh, uh, folks who, who really couldn't find anything better to do, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, uh, are uh, tempted by these huge subsidies and incentives that are there in the marketplace. Um, many of these companies I know or know of, uh, I know of the people uh, behind these companies. And, uh, and I can tell you, I mean, these are companies with zero R&D uh, versus somebody like us that has 1,400 people working here, uh, including very soon about 500 on EV alone. Um, really no manufacturing facilities to speak about, no real supply chain and no control um, and, you know, uh, visibility line of sight into that supply chain. Um, and uh, all they do is, uh, I'm sorry to say, import some junk out of somewhere that has not really been validated for this marketplace and put it out there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the regulatory environment, for example, under the guise of low-speed vehicles, mm -hmm. etc., is such uh, that it permits them to do so. Right. So, you know, um, when the flower doesn't bloom, you, you fix the environment, not the flower. Uh, you know, for example, for the longest time, we've had these ramshackle e-rickshaws, which are a safety hazard, a traffic nuisance, uh, allowed to ply on our roads, not meeting uh, safety and emission norms, just because they are quote-unquote low-speed vehicles. They're not even vehicles that are registered. You don't even know where they are and what is happening with them. So I think uh, these are loopholes that we have ourselves created. Um, and, uh, you know, people have then exploited. These have to be fixed. So whether it's in terms of uh, batteries, uh, as you mentioned, or cells, or whether it is in terms of complying with certain um, safety uh, emission norms, etc., certain testing, uh, all of this becomes very important. I don't think the uh, answer really lies in a lot of inspection and audit and all. We don't want to go back to the inspector Raj. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be in the intellectual Raj. So, uh, so we need to frame uh, the right policies for that. And of course, um, if it is uh, found or felt that some people, for example, I have heard of companies that submit one battery for testing and actually use a different specification in actual production. You know, if somebody is uh, just uh, flouting the norms like that, then there must be very, very serious consequences for that. Um, uh, so we have to attack this bottom-up and top-down. Right. Uh, 
what we're going to use the loophole which is allowing defective cells, defective battery management systems to come into India and uh, fly on the roads like this? Well, right now there's a host of issues. The, it has to do with the uh, specifications uh, itself. As I said, for example, it is well known that with lead acid batteries, uh, you are going to face uh, uh, issues not just uh, with the usage of products depending on the uh, uh, application, but also post use, for example. Um, then in terms of products themselves, uh, uh, how robust they are, how, how they are tested, uh, you know, even um, agencies like ARAI, etc., I think are also climbing the learning curve themselves. Uh, so all of that uh, testing needs to be more robust. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of uh, distribution, service, etc., uh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, fortify uh, that as well. So it's really across the chain um, that uh, we need to tighten uh, our belts everywhere uh, so that uh, such incidents uh, do not occur. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, a lot of these products were never meant to operate at these temperatures uh, or in these traffic conditions. And if they will be randomly imported and put out there, uh, I mean, surely when uh, uh, companies are getting approval, when they are getting the fame benefit, mm -hmm. and therefore they are uh, obviously getting approval for their product, I mean, how can you approve facilities that are not backed by any R&D, any manufacturing, virtually no testing? You know, I, I just don't understand that. No, the monsoon should actually make it uh, better, I would suppose. Uh, the peak summer is what was uh, <coughs> really of concern and that has led to some of the incidents that, that have occurred. Uh, but, uh, you know, whether we are out of the woods or not, uh, time alone will tell because uh, uh, there's still a lot of makers out there that I believe should not be making electric vehicles. Um, and I don't think enough is being done um, to put a lid on this uh, as quickly as it should be because, uh, you know, I can't put it more simply than this. Uh, they are playing with people's lives uh, and that's just not right. Uh, no. Well, that's all the motorcycle news. Back to you, Sovini and Bert. And again, some very strong statements there uh, from Rajiv Bajaj. Of course, uh, most of it true. But I hope you guys heard the heard the big scoop. Uh, there's only one new powertrain, uh, ICE powertrain that is being developed. Has Rohit frozen? I guess Rohit has frozen. But yeah, the big the big scoop over there. Let me tell you guys is that one powertrain that's very very crucial because this means Bajaj is effectively moving very strongly towards electrification. Uh, and will will very quickly, I think, now move away from ICE for that matter. So that is certainly very, very big news. Okay. Yes, like people have mentioned in the comments also, candid uh, comments, but that's something that uh, is always expected from uh, Mr. Rajiv Bajaj. Um, We'll have the interview, in fact, we'll have the full interview up on our YouTube channel also very shortly. It's, it's just come in uh, today, so we didn't have much time. Just quickly put it together so that we could play it. We didn't even have time to actually watch the entire interview. Uh, but here's a question for you. Um, where did it go? There's one on... Uh, yeah. Prabhan wants to know, should he buy uh, the new seven-seater SUV? Uh, the price uh, is 20 lakhs on road, or should he go with a second-hand vehicle that costs the same? Well, if you're getting a second-hand seven-seater uh, that costs the same, uh, I would assume this is a much larger vehicle, which you would get a little more space, boot space for that matter, Prabhan. Uh, so my recommendation would be if you're getting a good value, good good deal on that, in terms of quality also, the vehicle is still quite uh, well, well maintained, then I would recommend you going for that. But uh, otherwise, it's uh, the seven-seater new. If you can get a new seven-seater SUV, uh, there are lots of other benefits to that which of course means you will get uh, warranties and a lot of the claims and issues that you would otherwise have could be cleared out with a newer vehicle rather than with an older used vehicle. Rohit, uh, here's a question uh, from VD. He says, only one new ICE uh, model uh, under development, electric motorcycles incoming. Uh, he feels for the fate of Talk Motors uh, once Bajaj comes up with their versions of electric motorcycles. What do you think? 
Well, that's that's the ongoing debate, right? Irrespective of the body style, be it a scooter, be it a motorcycle, it's the ongoing debate that uh, you know, just the way he just said, uh, he calls them upstarts, we call them startups, but uh, that startups versus traditional manufacturers, that's always going to be the debate, and uh, especially in the uh, in the light of current uh, you know events where we have seen all these EV fires happening, we are we are seeing. Uh, seeing a lot of new brands cropping up and uh, literally just putting together stuff versus traditional manufacturers like these uh, literally putting in so much R&D and uh, bringing out a more relatively more reliable product, at least on paper. Uh, it's always going to be uh, a big challenge. And one ICE, uh, only one new ICE uh, powertrain under development, I think that is that is a big news because he's not only talking about himself, he's also talking about KTM, Husqvarna, uh, you know, so it is. It is definitely a big news now. What is this powertrain? I don't know. Uh, maybe it may not be the 490 uh, platform from KTM. Maybe it may not be the uh, you know the the platform that they have developed with uh, Triumph purely because these vehicles are already developed. They are in prototype stage and uh, you know already being road tested. Uh, so probably that's the reason why he's discounting them from this conversation. Uh, maybe the one that he's talking about is is a completely new powertrain uh, uh, for the fossil fuel vehicles. Uh, but of course, we have had a shorter version of uh, the interview and the bites here on the show. But uh, what he's also mentioned is uh, the current uh, crop of ICE vehicles will continue to be sold for quite some time because it's not just the Indian market. These uh, these guys are also heavy on exports. And, uh, you know, in the overseas market, some of the, uh, the more emerging markets like, uh, you know, uh, Latin America or even Africa, uh, there, these vehicles will continue to ply for quite some time, and uh, they will not move to an electrified, uh, you know, portfolio altogether. But yeah, for future development, this statement by Ra Rajiv Bajaj is really big. Okay, we have uh, a question here for uh, from uh, Mangesh uh, Rohit. He says that he's seen your BMW 2 Series review. Uh, he wanted to ask, uh, why are rear-wheel drive cars more fun to drive than uh, front-wheel drive? Bert, do you want to answer that? Well, uh, Professor Bert. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's it's a, it's a very simple thing. Uh, there, are, there are two aspects to this, of course. And uh, for uh, efficiency, uh, cost of packaging, uh, and various other reasons, uh, front-wheel drive cars uh, are more popular, or at least they're manufactured in larger numbers. Uh, it also makes it more cheaper. Rear-wheel drive cars are much more expensive to manufacture because, well, uh, the parts that are required for rear-wheel drive, there are a lot more parts. There are more complicated parts for that matter. Uh, and this increases the costs. Uh, why are rear-wheel drive more fun to drive than front-wheel drive? Essentially because you can slide the rear out and drift. Uh, rear wheel drive cars alone you cannot drift front wheel drive cars that is a misnomer please don't get fooled by a lot of the peers that i know we keep talking about drifting front wheel drive cars but unfortunately that does not happen uh, it's also fairly uh, tricky in a way to drift all wheel drive cars as well because essentially newer modern cars when they don't entirely switch off traction control systems and the ASP keeps cutting in and distributing torque to whichever wheels it is there, direct slip in and if that slip is direct in the front wheels, it will direct far over there. And that kind of kills the whole uh, fun of getting into a slide. So rear wheel drives, rear wheel drive cars essentially are far easier because all of that torque, all of that power is directed straight to the rear wheels and uh, if there is a significant amount of power at your disposal, it can very easily cause slip and uh, well, ship your car out of uh, line and get you into a nice controlled slide if you know what you're doing. Uh, so that's essentially why rear wheel drive cars are a lot more fun because they can be drifted around racetrack. You can have a lot of fun doing that. If you know what you're doing again, guys, disclaimer, I am not advocating this. While I do enjoy it myself, I do tell everyone, please do so with the utmost caution. Okay, we'll take one last question. Uh, is the C3 a CKD unit? No, uh, the C3 is not a CKD unit, uh, Suraj. Uh, Citroen, for that matter, has gone down and uh, localized a very, very high percentage. I think about 93% uh, of the car is completely localized, 93, 95%, maybe higher also. I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, but there's a very, very high amount of local content in the C3. And from day one, that uh, their effort has been to localize as much as they could. 
So all local vendors, all regional vendors have been providing parts uh, for this. I think the one or two parts would be certain semiconductors that are coming in from overseas and maybe control units, uh, the electronic control units that will come from overseas. But apart from that, everything else is localized. It's not a CKD, it's manufactured right here in India. All right. Guys, uh, that's all we have on this week's show, though we'll quickly uh, get you a teaser of what's on uh, the TV show tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, here's a quick look. This motorcycle you see here, the 2022 RC390, is a culmination of all their efforts over the years. It's an all-new motorcycle and this bike is just built for one purpose, to egg you on to do better out on track, to be comfortable as a touring machine out on the road. Let's talk about the hottest EVs launched in India recently. Kia has launched the EV6 pretty much around the ballpark figure that all of us were estimating. What has really caught us off guard is that BMW has launched the i4 just 5 lakh rupee more than the EV6. These are arguably two of the most popular super nakeds in India at the moment. These, the Speed Triple 1200 and the Street Fighter V4S. Sorry, sorry. So you can tune in at... Because it's absolutely essential to have it when it's warm rather than getting it cold. And also on the show. <laughs> it's also essential to have show. it on the show. I'm working from home. <laughs> <laughs> and Soini is not hiding behind the camera. Nothing. Yeah. I didn't even try to eat today. I don't even have my producer, so I can't eat today. <laughs> All right, we'll see everybody uh, next week. Well, if evening, Bert and trying. Rohit... Say good evening to all of you guys out there. Have a fun weekend and don't forget to watch the show. Lots of, lots of content over there. Please like the video today as well. Like all the videos that you're seeing on YouTube as well. We're putting a lot of effort in giving those videos to you. And pretty soon, we're going to amp up um, a lot of things that people have been complaining about for that matter. Um, we're going to get our game up as well. And of course, uh, follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. And we'll keep getting a lot more content over there as well. A lot of stuff is happening there too. So yes, there's going to be a new overdrive out pretty soon. Something very interesting is off, uh, in the offing. Rajiv Jaj is not the only one to have some interesting information coming your way. We've also got something <laughs> up our sleeve. So we will see you very soon. Have a great weekend, guys. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye-bye.